So uh, yeah, we'll be talking about Cython today. Uh, Cython is a language very similar to Python that, um, that allows us to write code that executes almost at the speed of C, but at the convenience of having a higher level uh, language. So the example code for today is uploaded on BSpace. You can also grab it off uh, my Git uh, repo. So username Stefan V, and it's under the repo Cython underscore AY250. Uh, so that's just an archive of uh, the different source files that we will be looking at today. Right, so many of you might have seen this diagram before. Uh, this illustrates the typical trade-off we make when we work with scripting languages versus compiled languages. Uh, on the one axis here, the y-axis indicates the ease of, ease of use, and the x-axis, uh, the execution speed. So ease of use, you can think also uh, the amount of time you put in when you write a program, and the execution speed is how much time it takes the computer to then uh, evaluate that code. Now, your time is obviously much more valuable than the computer's, uh, so that is why we choose to use Python. Python saves us a lot of time because we can basically take our mental model of a piece of code and just put it in source code form. Python is very similar to English, so it's, uh, it's very easy to express your thoughts in Python. So, very, um, so it's easy to use, low coding time. Uh, on the other extreme, we have languages like C++. C++ can be fairly hairy, hairy to code, uh, but once you've written your piece of C++ code, it executes extremely rapidly. Uh, other languages in this domain uh, would be Fortran, although I might even argue that Fortran is a lot simpler than C++ uh, to use, so we could probably move it uh, you know, somewhere here on the, on the graph. Uh, but what we're going to try and do today is to bridge those two worlds. So to go from a world where we have uh, a high-level language, easy to use, and to get the same performance as we would uh, out of a language like C++. Now, there are many projects that already aim to do this, uh, in SciPy, we've got Weave, which allows you to take a, a C snippet as a string and compile it and execute it. Uh, Swig allows you to wrap C++ code. Num Expression is a project that, ju that does uh, just-in-time compilation of, of um, uh, expressions. Um, and then, of course, NumPy is, is one of those efforts as well, because NumPy uh, wraps the lower-level uh, linear, uh, linear algebra and other uh, libraries. So it's essentially Fortran and C being executed every time you do um, you know, a dot product, matrix multiplication, uh, broadcasting, all of those things execute in C, but you do it on a much higher level. Unfortunately, NumPy is, is limited if you've got a, uh, an algorithm. Uh, so for example, say you've got, you've got a matrix, and uh, let me just get something to write with. Hmm. The box. Oh, here? Yeah. Uh-huh. Perfect. All right. So NumPy is ideal when you've got a large block of numbers. You want to execute some operation on all of those numbers at the same time. You want to do the same thing to all those numbers. But if you are in the situation where you have a matrix of numbers um, and the number x, uh, the you do some computation on x, that influences the computation you're going to do on Y, and that influences, in turn, the computation you're going to do on Z. Now, or Z, you guys call it. So, um, <laughs> you, um, now, this kind of operation you can't really express in, in, in NumPy, because if you, if you do, uh, you know, if you say my output array equal to um, my input array times two, or any expression of that form, it will just operate per element. So what do we have to do? Well, you can split it up into, so this won't work. So we can split it up into two for loops. So you can say for i in range um, rows and for j in range columns. And then you can do something, you know, you can, you can say um, a at position i j equals some expression that involves neighboring values of, of a that have already been computed. So what's the problem with this? Is this, is, this, uh, is this something we want to do in Python? So why not? Yeah, 
Right, it's slow. Uh, but why is it slow? Why is, why is Python so ridiculously slow when you have two nested for loops like this? So Python is an interpreter language, right? So it basically executes your source code line by line. So Python has no knowledge, really, when it enters these for loops of what comes later on. So can't do any kind of optimization. All it, all it can do is basically to step over this command, uh, once it, you know, do it over and over and over again. Um, and this is basically the process that we're going to try and optimize today using Cython. Right, so just uh, one last comment on this. In this trade-off of uh, ease, ease of use versus speed, um, there's something uh, called the T constant, and that is when your experiment starts to run for a period of time that's just long enough that you no longer want to sit and watch it, but rather uh, want to go and make a cup of tea or you know, walk around or do something else. Um, so sometimes just having your experiment run in, in 10 seconds instead of five minutes makes an enormous difference. So sometimes it is worth optimizing. Now, uh, you probably all heard the expression, uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil. So that's why this is the last lecture as well. Um, but uh, it's also a good, uh, you know, a, a good guideline to, to keep in mind. We don't want to optimize unless we, we really need to. Right, so like I said, uh, Cython allows us to cross this, this gap between a high-level language, low-level performance. Um, it's great because we get to code in a language that is essentially Python. It's a superset of Python, so it's Python with a little bit of syntax added on top, um, but with uh, the same speed advantages as C. Uh, when I taught in Italy, I came across this uh, interesting saying. I can't pronounce it, but what it comes down to is that uh, you can't have um, an inebriated wife and a full bottle of wine. And um, I think, you know, that is often the... The idea that people have is that you cannot have high-level code and low-level performance, but we'll see that that's not uh, really true. Uh, I think you guys say you can't have your cake and eat it too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, what kind of improvements ca uh, are we looking at here? Well, we've got, if you just compile a piece of Python code, just put it on there, compile it without any changes, uh, we're probably looking at about a 30% speed increase, so not, not really worth writing home about. Um, but the loops do get quite a bit faster. They go to like two to eight times speed. And then I'll show you if we actually provide Cython with the types that we're using. If we tell it, we're working with integers here, we're working with floating point numbers, we can go hundreds of times faster. So that's how we're going to reach warp 10. Cython's got uh, about, well, these are four of the very common use cases. Uh, the one is, of course, optimizing the execution of existing Python code. So the procedure that you'll do is you'll profile your code. Have you guys done profiling at all? So I'll show you an example of that. So it's basically execute your code, time how long the different functions take to execute, take the one that's slow, that's causing the bottleneck, and replace that function with Cython. Uh, we also often want to wrap existing C or C++ code. We'll see examples of that. And then Python has this annoying thing called the, the global interpreter lock. So if you try and... Uh, split your program up into threads in Python. So say you've got eight CPUs in your computer, so you believe you can split your uh, operation up uh, into eight blocks and just have each CPU uh, do an eighth of that for you. Well, you're going to run into problems with Python because Python has this thing called the global interpreter lock. It means that none of those threads can access um, Python objects without first acquiring this global interpreter lock. And what all that, that really comes down to is that only one thread ex executes at a time. So Python, Python doesn't make it easy for you to use threads. You typically have to split up into multiple processes. But because Cython is written in C, you don't have that constraint. So we'll see how to utilize that as well, or how to uh, work around the global interpreter lock, rather. Uh, and then the last use case is just when you want to mix C and Python, but you typically don't want to use the C API. I don't know how many of you have seen the, the Python C API. Not pretty. Um, we'll, uh, we'll have a look at the C code that Cython generates, which is a little bit more ugly than what you'd write by hand, but you know, it uh, will give you a good indication of, of what you're being spared here. Right, so for this tutorial, uh, this afternoon, I'll take a piece of pure Python code, we'll benchmark it, go through the profiling process I just described, and we'll find that it's too slow. Then we'll take that code, we'll run it through Cython without changing anything, 
and we'll find that it's a little bit faster, like I said, about 30% faster. Uh, then we'll tell Scython a little bit about that code. We're working with integers, we're working with doubles, etc., and then we'll find that it's a lot faster. Uh, so when we're done with that example, I'll show you how you can integrate NumPy arrays with Scython. I'll show you how to uh, do multiple threads, the global interpreter lock I was just referring to, and then finally how to wrap C libraries inside of Scython. So you can access those C libraries straight from, from your Python scripts. All right, from Python to Scython. So this example is just a numerical integration. So your function is this red curve here. And these are uh, the sampling points. So how do we approximate the integral of this function? Well, we just uh, construct these little blocks underneath the function, and we add their areas together. So you can see that I have this interval. It's divided into one, two, three, four blocks. So um, yeah, so n equal to four. And the distance, uh, the, the distance, uh, this distance here, the length of each block, is just the total interval, which is 0 to 2. So that's 2 in this case, divided by the number of blocks. So we've got 0.5 as the uh, basis length of each block. And then the height would be whatever the function value is at that point. And then you just calculate the area of each block, add them all together, and it gives you a rough approximation of the integral of your function. Uh, if you've got, so here's just an example where I made the blocks even smaller. And you can say that, see that the smaller the blocks become, the more closely the integral is approximated. So how would the computer code look for computing that? So ha have you guys seen the first line of code here? Okay, so from future import division just means don't use integer division, always use slashes. This is now standard in Python 3, by the way. Um, and then we define the function that we'd like to integrate. I just made up a function x to the power of 4 minus 3 times x. Could be whatever you want. And here's the, the real bit of code is the, the contents of integrate f. So we provide it with two parameters, a, b. That, that's the start and the end of the interval over which we want to integrate and then n, the number of blocks that we want to use. So first we calculate, uh, again, the base length of that block. It's the interval divided by the number of blocks. That gives you that basis width. And then, um, yeah, for, for each block, you just compute the function value at that specific point, and we multiply all of those. After adding them all together, we multiply them by dx. So um, do you guys roughly follow what what I'm doing here. Is it more or less clear? OK. So it doesn't really matter what we're doing, but just, uh, just so you have an intuitive idea of what's going on. All right, so if you uh, execute this piece of code in, um, let's see what happens when we execute it in Python. Just to make sure, OK. So I import integrate. And I call integrate f. Uh, we can choose any, uh, any interval we want. So uh, 1 to 10. And say we want 10,000 blocks. And it tells us that the answer is 19,000 something. Uh, we can run. You remember the time it command in IPython? So time it executes a function numerous times and then picks the, the minimum execution time. Why does it do that? Why does it pick the minimum? If you had to benchmark a piece of code to, in other words, execute it to see how fast it runs, um, how would you approach it to get an accurate answer? Would you run it once? What's the problem with running a piece of code once? There are other things that can make, that can make it run slowly if you computer something else. Right. That's, that's, that's one option. What else? How different is it? What? You would average it? Yeah. So, so say, um, say you were doing a, you were running uh, your function 100 times, and during the first 50, some system process spun up like you just described, um, but during the last, you know, you'd have nothing. Then your average would sort of be a mixture between this really bad timing and a good timing. Um, but that's an option. Um, so any other ideas? So 
what IPython does is it just executes your function a thousand times and takes the min minimum run. So if you execute it, even if there are system effects, even so normally the first time you run a function, uh, the computer needs to load a, st a lot of stuff into memory. So that's a very expensive operation. Your CPU is, in fact, uh, factors faster than, um, you know, a factor 10 maybe faster than your, or 100 faster than your, your memory. So it's really slow to access your computer's memory. So the first time you run your function, data gets moved into memory. The second time you run your function, that data comes straight from the cache, so the memory right on the CPU, so super quick. Uh, so the first timing is already useless. You can throw that out. Um, like I said, if anything spins up uh, during, during your trials, it's useless. You can throw them out. So in the end, you're just looking for the fastest, fastest timing that your computer can do and that you get by taking the minimum. Yes? Right, so, yeah. Yeah, so if you really want to know in, you know, if you, if you deployed this on a commercial system, what would you get? Maybe his solution of taking the average over a very large number of runs would be a better approach. Yeah, but um, overall, if you want to, you know, compare between different runs, uh, your own code, then you need sort of a consistent way to measure. And for that, the minimum is really good. Uh, okay, so... Currently, we're standing at about 6.22 milliseconds per loop. Now, this is a fast operation, so we don't really care. Uh, I could make that, let's say we took uh, 100,000 points. Yeah, so now we're factor 10 slower. So, you know, it's starting to creep up. And if we, I, I mean, I can increase that number until we really end up being in trouble. So let's just do the rest of these experiments all with what do I have there? 100,000 points, right? All right, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to take that exact snippet of Python code and I'm going to run Cython on it. So do you guys all have a working version of Cython? Yeah? You can import Cython inside of your interpreter? Okay. And you should be able to execute the Cython command on the terminal as well. So you run Cython and then the file name which is typically a .py file or .pyx. Pyx is the Python-specific extension. So let's see what happens. So I'll just adjust the... Can you guys see at the back, or should I make the font a little bit bigger? Is that right? Yep. Okay. So, so you run Cython on your .py file. Um, and then you should have a file called integrate.c there that looks like that, just filled with C code. Let me load that up for you so you guys can see. Yeah, so this is really pretty. Um, this is the kind of thing you'd maybe not like to write yourself. Like I say, it's a little bit uglier than you would have written yourself because you have all those underscore underscore picks and then you know weird variables in there. That's just for Cython to, to make sure everything is unique. But um, it doesn't look that much better when you, when you do this by hand. Because when you work with, this, with a Python API, you have to, do, um, you, you have to you know, track, uh, do reference counting, track all sorts of things that you wouldn't normally do, allocate, deallocate objects. Uh, so it gets, it gets messy fairly easily. So here specifically, um, is the snippet that, so in, inside the file you'll see comments with Python and then the C code that does exactly the same thing. So if you can somehow warp your mind around all these underscore picks things, um, somehow we'll find in here that there's an x to the power of 4. Let's see if we can spot that. Um, I see a power, so pi number power some variable to the power of integer 4. So that happens. Then there's a minus somewhere. There's a multiply for the 3. Yes, 3 with x. And uh, there's the subtraction. And then that gets returned. What's the unlikely view? I haven't seen that before. Oh, no, that's, uh, I, I guess that's a Cython specific macro that they defined. <coughs> Say what? I guess, I guess it is. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, 
What was that language that implemented not go to but come from? I always, I always found that rather amusing. That, that would make for really hard to understand code. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, right, so, so this is the kind of thing that Cython generates for you. And then you can compile it. Uh, it's got the line here somewhere. Yeah, there we go. So the first line you see on the screen here is used to compile it. You see, I just call the GCC compiler. It's called with a minus O2 flag for some optimization. Um, it gives the Python include path, uh, takes our C file, and produces a .o file. Um, and that file, say again? Oh, well, if you ever want to know what GCC does, you just uh, load up the man page, and you can see fpec. It's not the one. Come on. It's basic. Maybe that's uh, <laughs> there. We go. Um, so it emits what uh, they say it emits uh, position independent code. So it means your code can be reallocated in memory and still execute fine. They don't hard hard code memory addresses, I presume. Um, we're basically going to be using Python. Loads is a dynamic library, so you need that, I presume. Um, Right, but when you execute that command, you, you get the .o file out, and, and Python can import that .o file. So you can do import integrate underscore compiled, and Python would load it up. Uh, you don't usually want to remember that GCC syntax, because sometimes your system looks a little bit different. You need different compile flags and so on. So we much rather write a setup.py file. So you just construct a setup.py file, and you put this in there. So it includes, it imports a couple of stuff from distutils, the uh, compilation tools, and it also imports a special compilation uh, tool from Cython, and then we just write this little snippet of code. So we say, so we've got a setup, we use um, Cython's build extension, hey Paul, um, and then we're going to add an extension, it's called integrate, uh, this wasn't, oh, that's a typo, I think that should just be that should be integrate compiled and integrate.py. Yeah. But basically, you tell it what the extension name is that you want to build, what are the source code files, those all go in there. And then you run setup.py, build extension, and minus i for build it in the current directory in place. And then we'll, it will generate that GCC call for you. So maybe just if you could all go into the demos directory, into the integrate subdirectory there and just type python setup.py build underscore ext minus i and see if it, uh, if it builds for you. Make this a bit bigger. Oh, that just messed up my colors, yeah. There we go. You compiled? Anyone else managed to compile it? We're good? Yeah. Good. All right. OK, so you see there's the GCC line I showed you. Um, oh, and my system is a little bit fancy. It's got some, some other flags in it. but. Once you've written your setup.py file, I've got a couple of extra functions in here, but yeah, there you see it. So we generate the integrate compiled uh, Python module, and the source file is in integrate.py. OK, so let's see. We, uh, let's import that into Python. So I'll first import integrate. That's the pure Python version. And then import integrate compiled. 
Uh, what happened there? Okay, there we go. Oh, I um. So. Yeah, I just removed that C file. I don't know why. When I generated by hand, it caused problems. Not sure why. Uh, I think I removed integrate.c. And then you just do the Python setup with Bible DXT. Yeah. Uh, integrate compile. There we go. Does that work now? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Is it what? Yeah, but you just you don't type the .so. It's a it's not a Python file. No, it's it's a dynamic library, but uh, it's a Python extension. Okay. Yeah. All right, so let's uh, let's time those two. So we've got our original function integrate f. Let's go from zero to ten. We said take a hundred thousand points. I think that how long did that take? About six point sixty six milliseconds. And now we'll do the compiled version, and uh, there we go. Compiled version. Yeah, so Right, so there are the two timings, 66.4 milliseconds for the original, 47.4 for the compiled version. So a 1.4 times speed increase. That's, that's not incredibly exciting, but it's something. <laughs> that's a good question, Paul. <laughs> so... I, I'm not sure if that's right, but they're the same. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right, so we used time it. We saw that there was about a 1.4 times speed increase. And now the question is, can we help Cython to do even better? And yes, we know we can. We can give it some clues. We can tell it uh, what types of variables are we working with here. Uh, Cython does have a very basic type inferencing engine, so it can guess to some extent what types of variables you're working with, but it's very conservative because it has to be careful. You know, when you, when you use Python, you can assign anything to anything, so it has to be really careful that it doesn't try to do optimization um, on objects of the wrong type. So why do you think it helps to provide Cython with this information? Why would Cython be able to make things faster if I tell it, for example, that i or some variable is an integer. Yeah. So, so Cython, I mean, Cython doesn't know that it's an integer. So, what does it have to do when you send it the variable i? It has to look through and make sure that it's never passed to be anything size of integer. Exactly. So, if you do, if, you know, if you do a simple for loop where you say for i. Um, in range n, when Cython tries to compile this, it has to you know check 
what is the type of that variable i? Because it's now going to be assigning different values into that i. So i could be uh, a double, or it could be you know, an integer, it could be anything. Um, and in Python, you're allowed to do all sorts of strange assignments towards objects. And you can't, you can't just do that. Um, you know, you have to make sure that it's the, the right type you're working with. On the other hand, once Scyther knows that i is, for example, if we tell it i is an integer, then it doesn't have to do any checks. It doesn't have to do any unpacking of Python objects. It can just write straight to that memory location values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it drastically reduces the overhead. But so it doesn't figure this out when you compile it. Hmm? So Cython is better than Python because it, it does some stuff to make it faster, right? Which is not forty percent faster. But it doesn't go through and figure out that I is never not an integer. No, it doesn't it, it it's not that clever. It can't so let's look at that uh how how, how does it obtain that speed up if it hasn't done it's just the thirty to twenty percent. So that's because the loop now executes in, in C, and it doesn't execute in Python anymore. So if you run it via the interpreter, the interpreter is just basically looping over that thing. Uh, now it's a, a C for loop, so it's a little bit of a speed increase there. But the problem is what happens inside the for loop is still slow, so that doesn't help you. So here's the code that we saw early on that was generated. Um, just squint and, and try and make out what's going on here. But uh, you'll see, constantly you'll see things like pi number power or uh, pi number multiply or pi number subtract. Those are all calls into the Python C API. It says, I've got a Python object. I believe, believe this is a number. I don't know if it's an integer or a floating point number, but it's some number and do this operation, you know, subtract these two Python numbers from one another. Uh, a Python object uh, is a pointer to some place in memory uh, with a description of exactly what is contained there. So. So what needs to happen here is that Python then needs to unpack this thing. It needs to go and see, oh, what is stored inside the first one? That might be an integer. What is stored inside the second one? That might be a float. And it needs to call the appropriate um, operation on that. It's just a lot of overhead. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to tell Cython what these types are, and we'll see if that helps. How do we do that? Well, Python understands, uh, uh, Cython understands when we just write the type in front of the number so we can, in, uh, when you've got the x argument to your function f, you can specify double there. So it now knows that the um, x that will be passed into f is always a double. And then inside our function here, this is the alternative syntax, we can do a c def, which means in c define that s is a double, and that dx is a double, and that i is a size type. Size type is the C language for uh, int, basically, po uh, positive integer. And yeah, we also tell it that when we integrate our function, we'll be pr providing a double a, b, and the number of blocks n, which is an integer. Right, so that's, that's all I added. Yep. Is Cdef a Cython? Yeah. Cdef is special to, to Cython. Uh, you could also, so this is one syntax. The other syntax would be to simply write uh, cdef in front of, of each. So you could do uh, cdef uh, double s and cdef um, double dx. Yeah. Th these are equivalent. This just when you define a number of different var variables. It's handy to just put cdef colon up there. But you don't need cdef when you define them inside the function. No, not not when you when you specify the parameters. No. If I run the Python interpreter on that mm -hmm. code, would you get confused? Yeah, Python can't understand this anymore. We've now broken this for Python, uh, but Cython will know what to do with it. I have several questions. Yeah, go for it. So if I don't declare every variable in that. If you don't declare every variable, will it, will it will still run. Cython won't mind. It will just be slower because it will assume then that that object can be anything. It can be any Python object. Right. But the things I have declared, I'll get a speed up. They'll, they'll give you a speed up. Yeah. So you typically, if you have a counter like for i in range n, 
you typically want to, want to define that I because it's going to be called every single time in the loop. So anything that's used in every single loop iteration, so I, uh, S, um, and in this case, yeah, DX and, and A, you want all these variables to, to be defined. Yeah. Any other questions? Does this look good? Okay, let's compile it and see what happens. Okay, so let's do that. So I just uh, extended my setup.py file. I've got so I've got integrate.py, which was the original we wrote. I've got integrate types, which is this version I just showed you, um, and then I've got two more that I wrote down. But I'm just showing you how the setup.py file looks. It looks exactly the same for for each different version that I wrote. Um, so, okay, you call setup.py, you build the extension, it says all my extensions are built, so let's go into Python, we import integrate, it's the original, integrate compiled is just the compiled version, and integrate types is the version where I specified the, the types. So let's time them. Pure Python, Scython version, and Scython version with types. Okay, so that looks a little bit better. I mean, we've shaved another 20 milliseconds off, so 60, 64, 47, 23, so what's it? That's it. We, we doubled the speed again, so that's not bad, but... Earlier on, I didn't talk about doubling speeds. I mentioned like you know, maybe a factor 100. So um, this doesn't get us all that excited, right? So what's the matter? What did I do wrong? Why isn't Scython producing what I promised it would? Let's see what the bottlenecks are. So here's what's happening. We have a Python layer in which everything Python occurs, and then we've got the C layer where things are really fast. Python slow, C is fast. So what happens? We call our function integrate f with its parameters. And now we've got this very nice fast for loop in C that we just defined. We gave it all the, uh, the different types. So we expect this loop to execute very rapidly. So this basically in C looks just like this loop for i is uh, 0 to uh, less than uh, 100,000. Increase the counter and then execute f of x. And that's exactly where the problem is. In every loop iteration, we execute our function f. But what is f? f is a function defined right up there. And that's a Python function. So what happens is inside your for loop, you jump out into the Python interpreter. The Python interpreter says, ah, oh, you're trying to run f of x. And then it says, OK, f of x, you can run it. It's, inter it's uh, implemented in Cython. So it sends you back to Cython and then it calls the, the Cython version of that function, and your S is updated, and your loop goes around. But this is, this is the big problem, is that you jump from C into Python and back again. So how can we avoid that? Well, we can say, let's just not make this function available to Python. Let's define it as a pure C function, because then the for loop can execute, all everything can execute on the C side, and we never have to jump back into Python. So how do we do that? Well, we add the following. Where we, ha we used to have def f, we now just say c def f. So c, define the function in c, and you have to provide the output type as well. So this is just like if you wrote a function in c, you would have to tell it um, what's the, what, what are the types of the input parameters and what is this function returning. So you have to tell it, well, it's going to send back a double. Hmm? It does. So that's the second optimization I made is that you could have x to the power of 4 here, except it would then call the c uh, power function from the math library. Uh, but this turns out to be quicker if you just do x times x times. Yeah. Um, and then the top line is just to tell Cython 
that it should use uh, C division instead of Python division. So Python division is, is overly careful. Like if you accidentally divide by uh, you know, a strange number like zero, it won't do any, it, it will, it will, Python will warn you. Uh, but we tell it, just use whatever C makes available, just use that implementation. So that speeds it up even further. Can you say again what, why you change that to XXX? Yeah, I think if you don't, um, I mean, the easiest is just to look what Cython generates. So uh, let, me, let me open that code for you so it's So I'm going to call the Cython command. I, I now change it back to x to the power of 4. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to call that for you. There we go. I'm going to call Cython with a minus A flag. So minus A does annotation, which means it generates an HTML file that I can open in my browser. Um, and that HTML file shows you shows you the code that was generated. Well, actually, it shows you original code. And then when you click on a single line, it expands to the code that was generated. So this is, this is quite handy. Uh, it also highlights it, the, the lines that are highlighted uh, indicate, well, the darker they are, the more time they will take to execute. So you can very easily see which uh, lines did you mess up on. If you, you, know, if you, if you didn't annotate a type, for example, let's, uh, let's remove one type annotation so you can see. Let's uh, not define uh, the, the type of i, the counter. So I'm not going to tell it that that's an integer. And then you see what happened? These two lines suddenly became very dark because it now says this, this for loop is now horribly slow. There's a, if you expand those lines, you see like, oh, there's just a lot of Python code that needs to deal with all those objects. Whereas the moment I define that type, compile, look what happens. This essentially becomes a for loop in C for some variable equals zero, some variable less than some value, increment that variable, single line in C. Um, okay, but what I wanted to show you was x to the power of four. It's not highlighted. It is fast. It, it calls pow, uh, pow, your uh, value. But that's still that's a single function call every time. So I think if you just uh, if you made this x times x times x times x, yeah, then it just takes that power call out. That makes it a little bit faster. Did you, did you all see what I what I showed him now? Right, so let's let's benchmark those last two. So it was integrate types and integrate Okay, so there's a twenty three millisecond version. That's the fastest one we had so far. And then we'll do this latest version of ours with a function defined in C. There you go. There we went down from 23.6 milliseconds to, to 704 microseconds. So, yeah. So we've already, we've had a times two speed up, we've had a 1.4 times speed up, we've had, whoa, what did I just do? There we go. Whoa. Is that right? 704. Oh. There we go. <laughs> okay, so I had a 1.4 times speed up the first time. I had approximately a 2 times speed up the second time. And I now had a 33.52. Ha! Huh. That's much closer to the 100 that I promised initially. So. Yeah, now we've taken our code, sped it up by 100 times. And let's just see how that looks again. 
you see there's the whole code snippet. We didn't have to add much. Uh, we had to annotate some types. This looks pretty much the same as it did before. This looks the same. And we just had to tell it that the callback function was in, was in C. So that's really it. That's, that's the magic. So um, before I go, go on, do you have any questions? Any, anything that doesn't quite fit your mind yet? We're good? I, yeah. I, don't know, I don't know what you're going to cover in, in, in the coming slides, so feel free to ignore questions. Yeah. So, like um, arrays, for instance, mm -hmm. with perhaps with unspecified dimensions. This, this is always a problem for me when I'm wrapping code in Python. Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll show an example of that just now. Yeah. All right. So this is probably not something you're going to use in, an awful lot, but I'm going to show you how to do arbitrary callbacks as well because it does come up from time to time. Uh, typically, when you have an integrate function like that, you don't want to uh, have only one function that can be integrated, right? We, we hard-coded that function x to the power of 4 minus 3 times x. Uh, so often what we'd rather want to do is to, to provide a function that should be integrated. So how do you do that in Cython? Well, you define a class. So Cython fully supports classes as well. In this case, I called my class integrand. Uh, it contains a single function that returns a double to function f. Uh, it takes a double as input, returns a double as output, and in this case, it's just not implemented. And then I subclassed that uh, and created a class called myfunc. And myfunc now just implements that as x to the power of 4 minus 3 times x. And then you can tell Cython, well, the first parameter to this function is going to be an integrand. And then we have exactly the same code as before. Here I use the three cdefs. You see the different syntax than before? This is exactly the same. But, um, but here uh, we call integrand.f. So this just allows us to specify a function to integrate instead of always integrating the same function. Uh, there's a small, there's a small uh, performance hit for that. So integrate any, I called it. So you'll see we, we did lose some speed there, back to 1.5 milliseconds again. But it does allow you to do callbacks. All right, so if you're all happy with that, we can move on to NumPy arrays. Okay. So your setup.py file is going to look pretty much exactly the same as in the previous example. The only thing you have to add is an include path because the NumPy headers are on some, in some path on your computer. And you get that by importing NumPy and then including the directory numpy.getInclude. If, uh, if you execute that, you'll see uh, import numpy, numpy.getInclude. It just gives you a directory on your computer and inside of that directory You've got the NumPy headers. So when you, when you write any code that, that works with NumPy, you need to tell it that's where you can find those headers. OK, so let's see how that file looks, uh, numpybasic.pyx. There we go. So Cython has a NumPy header, so it's aware of, of how the NumPy uh, ND array structure looks. So the first line you do is you say C import numpy as np. C import is a specific import. Uh, it's Cython import. So that is not available in pure Python. But when you do that, it basically loads the, the Cython definition of the numpy array. And then just like before, we want to specify what type of parameter are we going to pass into our function. In this case, the function foo is going to take uh, an ND array as input. 
So the, you could just say it's going to be an ND array, but typically you want to tell it what type of values are going to be included in that array and what's the dimensionality of that array. So in this case, I told it, well, we're going to have an array of float64 numbers. You'll see the mapping is very similar to the normal NumPy names. It's typically just uh, the type with an underscore T afterwards. That's how Scython likes it. And then we tell it that it's going to be a two-dimensional array, so typically a matrix or something like that. And it's going to be called R, ARR. OK, and then we define a new size type. You remember that size type is just uh, an unsigned integer, a positive integer. Uh, I and J are both then just positive integers. So for I in range R dot shape, and that's what you asked earlier on. Uh, what's this loop going to do? Well, it say, says for each I in R dot shape 0, what is R dot shape 0? If you have a matrix, what would R dot shape 0 be? Yeah, it's uh, so if you've got an, an M by N array called X, then X dot shape would be MN. So array dot shape, the zeroth value, that's your number of rows, and the first value is your number of columns. So loop over the rows, loop over the columns, and at each row column position, put the value i plus j. So if I had a two by two array, what do you think the output would be? What would this value be, first one? Zero. Zero. This one? One, two. Why? Well, this value is at position zero, zero. So what is zero plus zero? It's zero. This one is at position uh, one, zero. So one plus zero is one. This is at position one, one. So one plus one is two. See how that works. Hmm? Say again? For J, the AR shape 1 isn't highlighted. Oh. I don't know why. Yeah, I just wanted to point. Those are just things I wanted to highlight. There's no reason it, it isn't. There's no way to see and forward inside by Python, right? That's the Python thing. Did, yeah, you can't do that from Python. OK, so let's see. Uh, let's compile that. Just to show you that I'm using, this is the same code I just showed you up there. And call my build, build extensions in place. Now you see we get a couple of more uh, messages. It, it again calls GCC, but it now includes the NumPy include directory. That's why you needed to change your setup.py file, and then, yeah, so, so that includes the NumPy headers for you. Okay, uh, so let's see, import NumPy basic, and what do we say? NumPy basic has a function called foo, so there's a function foo, and it takes a two-dimensional float64 array as input. So let's create one. Just make zeros, two, two, and we make a d-type float64. Okay, so there's our output array, and then we call our function on x. There we go. <laughs> yeah, quick. Not even a millisecond. Yeah. So numpy under basic dot tab will not see CNC? 
if you do NumPy. Under basement? Yeah. yeah, it did complete. Yeah. Um, so. Is that, is that just because it's NumPy here? Is that why you're using Python by reference? Uh, well, in, in Python, when you it always sends a pointer around, right? So, so even in pure Python, if you provided the the R parameter there, it would always be a pointer to your original array. Um, and then if you index into that, so so Cython knows something about your array. It knows where the array stores the data and memory. Um, so when you do this assignment here, it takes that array, it dereferences it, goes into its memory, and it, it puts those values down there. Um, so you're, you're altering, the, you know, the, the NumPy array is just a sort of a high-level description of some memory. And Cython understands what that description is, so it allows you to, to write back to that memory. Uh, I think the, another option would have been to do something like... Um, to create a new output array, for example. That might be a more you know, standard approach. So you might have wanted to do something like um, out is zeros like uh, your input array. So this is going to be, let's see. So we could do that. But, and then let's say i plus j doesn't make much sense here. So let's just say it's our input array at that position plus uh, 10. So what, what would this do? It would just take your input array and add 10 at each position and store it to out. So what's the problem here? Well, in this case, number, uh, Cython doesn't know what out is. So we also have to tell it that out is a ND array of type float with two dimensions. So that would work. This call here, we'll have to import NumPy up there, will unfortunately still be a, a Python call, but it doesn't matter because we do it once. The expensive part of this process is, is this double for loop, and that will still be accelerated. So if I didn't make any mistake, we should be able to compile that. So let's just give x some other values. Um, okay, so there's our x. Uh, we want it to be float64. And then we call numpy basic dot foo on x. Uh, I should probably have a return statement here. That would help. <laughs> So it took my input array x, it added 10 to each number, and it created a new output array and, and sent that back. Uh, did that answer your question? Or not really? More or less, yeah. I mean, if More you or less. Had, like, a, I mean, this is just the case with a number array, but if you had a normal array, you wouldn't be able to, if you did an x in the array in a function, that, that's not going to live. The namespace would be, you know. Uh, should remain in that function. Well, Yeah, but no, no, you, you will see it on the outside. Uh, so what you, what you're seeing here, if we if we reconstruct, uh, let's just do a zero snippet in uh, in C. Um, basically, it's something like um, um, You know, this is the kind of code that will be generated. Um, so if you were working, yeah, this is this, yeah. What? Type on the function. Hmm? Type on the function. 
What? Did I? Oh. Um, so this is exactly the type of thing that's happening in the in the background. The pointer is being sent in, and uh, yeah, Cython's giving you access to the members of that pointer. And uh, yeah, so when you do something like uh, array i j equals five, what's really happening in the background is it's doing something like. Um, No, something like um, you know something like that is being generated in the in the background by Cython. Okay. Any questions about the NumPy example? Do you guys think you would be able to write a Tackle a small NumPy example like this, maybe. Okay. So, what I've provided you with, and this is also in the vSpace folder. If you go to problems, you'll see there's a directory called fractal, and a file called fractal.py. So if you run that. It runs fairly slowly, and it generates a colorized version of the Mandelbrot set. So, but you saw those 10 iterations, la, 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 it takes a while. If you want to do 100, you're going to wait quite a while. I wrote a NumPy version as well. The NumPy version is nice and snappy. So I had it run up to 99, and it generates it in much higher resolution. But I think, actually, I know that the Cythonized version of fractal.py can be even faster than the NumPy version. So your challenge for this breakout is to take this code. Um, NumPy what? The non-NumPy one. To generate this code, you'll see there are a couple of double for loops in there. Annotate the types and see if you, if you can make it run faster than the NumPy version. And, so, I mean, you guys have never written Cython before, so I would expect you to have a lot of questions while you're doing this. So just put up your hand, and I'll give you some hints along the way. Um, yeah.
how to do uh, parallel for loops in Cython. Uh, so the example I'm using is just uh, matrix ma uh, multiplication. So we've got a matrix A, and we're going to multiply it with a matrix B. I don't know if you remember from your linear algebra class how that works. But uh, basically, uh, to get this element here, uh, you take the first row of A, uh, and you multiply those elements by the elements in the, f in the second column of B, and that gives you the entry over there. So it's A11, B12, A12, B22. And if you sum those products together, you get that value. Um, here's another one. Uh, A31 times B13, A32 times B23. If you sum those together, you get that value in your output. Okay. So how would the Python code look for that? Well, we say for each row in A, so we're going to step through the different rows in A, um, we're going to multiply by each column in B. So J indicates, the, so I is the, the row here, J indicates the column in B, and our output is going to be row I, column J. And what's that value going to be? Well, we need to sum um, these values in A, so the row in A multiplied by the column in B. So that's what this sum here does. So we, for K, in um, the number of columns in A. So K is going to run 0, 1, 0, 1 in each case. And then we're just going to multiply those two together. We're summing it into a variable called S. And that's the value that eventually we write out to out uh, IJ. So are you satisfied that that would produce the matrix multiplication? No. Uh, this is hideously slow if you run it in Python. Again, two for loops, uh, it takes a really long time. So we'd like to speed it up a little bit. So what can we do? Well, we know by now that we just have to annotate the types. So we're going to tell it what the input types are and what the intermediate types are. The input types, we've got three ND arrays. Uh, they are all float64 arrays. They've got two dimensions because they're matrices. Um, a, B, the two matrices you want to multiply plus out, which is where your output's going to be stored. And then um, our different variables, they're almost all of size T. So I said that's a positive integer. Um, our counters I, J, and K, similar thing. And then just the sum, which is going to be a 64-bit floating point number. And then exactly the same code uh, we had before. Didn't change anything. Now, um, so we will get some speed up there. And I didn't even try the original Python version. That's just really slow. So um, yeah, so this is called dot. Yeah. OK, so import p range demo. And let's just satisfy ourselves that this thing actually does the job. So I'm going to construct a, f let's see, a f 1,000 by 500 matrix A, a 500 by 1,000 matrix B. So those dimensions would be compatible. What would the dimensions of my output be? Uh-huh, 1,000 by 1,000. So if everything works as planned, I call that function dot. If I dot A and B into out, it takes a while. And then the output, there's the output. Let's just verify that it's correct. Um, so we take the output. We subtract to, from it the dot, uh, the matrix multiplication as computed by NumPy. Get the v maximum value there. Yeah, 10 to the power of minus 13, that's small enough. So I'm satisfied that, that uh, out actually contains the matrix product between A and B. Uh, let's time it.
Okay, three point three and a half seconds per loop. So this currently makes use of only one of the two CPUs on my on my laptop, and I suspect that I should be able to get about almost half of that time if I if I utilize both cores. So let's see how to do that. Okay, very minor modifications to the code. Um, first, I added the two lines. Th those, those two at the top are just uh, telling Cython, do not do bounds checking on NumPy arrays. So if I accidentally try and assign values um, to an invalid row or in an invalid uh, column, it wouldn't complain. But it's an optimization. It saves some time. And it also tells it, don't do wrap around. So when I try and reference a row minus 1, NumPy will typically give you the last row, or minus 2 will give you the second last um, row. But this is telling it, don't, don't do that. So it saves a little bit more time. But the important part is really this. Um, we have our for loops, as in the previous example. But instead of range, I change this to p range. And p range is Cython language for parallel range. And that makes use of OpenMP. Um, and it will split this for loop up and send the data to two different CPUs on my computer. That's it. The only other thing I have to remember is that I have to use this with no gil clause. Uh, what that means is, you'll remember I spoke about the global interpreter lock earlier on. And what this basically says is that, don't worry, we're not going to be altering any Python objects while we're in these loops. Because that's illegal. Remember I said that you cannot, from multiple threads, you, you can't change um, uh, Python objects at the same time. So this is a guarantee to Python that we won't be messing with with uh, Python objects, we're just going to modify the memory of, um, well, we're going to modify s, which is a c variable. So Python doesn't care about that. And we're going to modify out the memory of out. But again, that's not, an, that's not a Python object. That's just memory inside the computer. OK, so let's see what that does. Um, I compiled that spot of my p range demo file, and that's just called p dot. So let's time that one. Did I understand correctly that p range constructs a parallel loop? Uh huh. So maybe this is a pointless question. Why did they name it p four, a parallel four? Why did they put it in the range statement rather than For instance, what if I uh, Yeah. But yeah, why why on the range that Why on the range not on the four? Uh I'll have to think about that. I'm gonna well, yeah. before you can do like for a value in or whatever, and then like you want one Because this if you if you say if it's on the range it can only be on whatever the output range is like. So we get a speed up of um Yeah, so that's, that's almost two. Now, I tried the first example I constructed for you uh, was, wasn't a matrix multiplied. It was something very simple. And then I noticed that I didn't get anything near this. I got sort of a 1.2 times speed up. So it ha whatever happens inside the, the parallel for loop needs to be fairly expensive. Otherwise, you don't really gain. Because to shuffle the data out to the different CPUs also comes with a cost. Uh, but when you do something as expensive as matrix multiplied, it, it makes a huge difference. And of course, if you had four uh, CPUs, um, you won't get quite a quarter of the speed. But um, you've seen, you've all seen those curves. Sort of, you you get um, you halve the speed, but then you know you can't quite get a quarter of the speed. And if you had eight CPUs, um, you know the, the curve changes, and uh, you, you you get less and less out of your multiple cores, um, unfortunately. But OK, so right. The, then I just want to finally show you how to wrap C and C++ libraries, because this is something that uh, people do quite often, uh, especially in academic codes. If you have Fortran code that you need to wrap, I put a link in there to uh, Andre Sart uh, Sartek's page. Uh, he's got a very good uh, overview of how to wrap uh, Fortran with Python. but. And I think, so what he does is he writes a C wrapper around the, or generates a C wrapper 
for the Fortran and then wraps the C inside of Cython. Uh, but we'll just see how to wrap C today. So, so there's the simplest example. If you want to call functions inside the C math library, uh, then you do C define, and then you have externally from math.h. So this is basically the same as a, an include math.h statement. And then you can say, well, include the functions uh, cosine, sine, and tan for me. They take double as an input. They return double as an output. And also uh, define the constant uh, or you know, expose the constant pi for me. Uh, those of you who have programmed C before would recognize this. And pi is just what C calls the Python constant. And then I have a function that executes those functions, cosine of 0 and cosine of pi. So I expect to see 1 and minus 1. So I compiled it already. So if I do import trig, test trig, there we go, 1 and minus 1. So it's really as simple as saying, which functions do I want? Uh, give their definition and call them. The only modification you need to make to your setup.py file is that you need to tell it that there's a library that you now need to link to, and that's libm. That's the, the math library that comes with C. So as long as you do that, things work fine. Okay, so that's the simplest case. Uh, C++ gets a little bit more hairy. So how many of you have programmed C++ before? Oh, okay. Fair number. So you'll recognize this. This is just a, a class definition. Uh, this is inside from an, from an H file. We've got a class circle inside the namespace geom uh, for geometry. That circle's got several public members. It's got a constructor that takes an x and y position. That's the center of the circle and the radius. It's got a destructor that, in our case, will do nothing. Um, you can get the x and y attributes. You can get the radius, get the area that gets computed. Or you can set the center, set the radius, and then the members x, y, and r are all private. So again, if we want to reference this from Cython, we just need to basically copy that header segment out and again say, uh, do a, a Cython definition externally from circle.h. That's a file I just showed you. Um, from the namespace geom, uh, define, c define a, a new class for us call it circle, and circle has a constructor, get x, get, get y, get radius, etc. Here's the, um, here's the Cython implementation of a class called PyCircle. This is a wrapper that I wrote around uh, that C++ class then. And the magic uh, is highlighted in the, in the two pink lines you see up there. So you've got, um, first we say our class pi circle is going to contain a, an instance of circle. Circle is that C class of ours. So that's the this pointer. It's just going to be an instance of that circle. And there's a special method here called C init that gets called when Cython constructs that uh, pi circle class. And you'll see that it initializes the this pointer. What does it initialize it to? Well, to a new instance of circle. So I basically call into that C++ code, construct a new circle object, and then just assign it to self this pointer. And from that point on, you can just handle that object as if it were um, an already, well, it is an already constructed C++ object that you could just work with. So you'll see, um, for example, when I defined area in my Python file, I just returned self to this pointer dot get area. So I just called straight through to the C++. Um, yeah, so nothing magic there. Let me just show you this. Uh, um, Yeah, so so here, for example, I took, um, I defined, in my Python class, I defined a property called center. But 
as Sentai return a tuple because you know Python's got this this nice structure, so why wouldn't I make use of it? So I just return self to this pointer dot get x and self to this pointer dot get y instead of having it split up as on the C side, where, on C plus plus side where this was split up into two, I just combine it into one. So when you combine that, when you compile that, and you import this class, um, what am I doing? There we go. circ dot by circle. You'll see um, I, added, I added a bit of a doc string here. Scython handles doc strings perfectly. So if you put a doc string in, it gets into your compiled code as well. So we can construct our pi circle with a center of 5, 5, and a radius of 1. What happens when I do that? Well, it calls C in it with those parameters, 5, 5, 1. That calls the C plus plus command new circle um, 5, 5, 1. That constructs my pointer. And now I've got an object that contains this pointer. And when I, for example, call this area property, it will return self to this pointer.getArea. So let's see. C.area. There we go. C. Dot, what else do we have? Center is 5, 5. And you can also set center to 5, 10. And there you go. Okay. So not much magic going on there. The, again, the setup.py file needs to be modified ever so slightly. Uh, you just need to tell it that, again, we're trying to uh, generate the extension circ. Uh, it's written up in circ.pyx, but in this case, also include the C++ file circle.cpp. And please use the language C++, not C. So that's it. Uh, you've now seen how you can build uh, code that is both high level and executes rapidly with Scython. Uh, oh, I never showed you the profiling. Um, that's quite important, so let me just do that. That's really quick. So in IPython, you've got the prun command. Um, So I just imported a module called some task. It's got a method called execute. And if you do prun execute, so you can put any Python uh, function call there. If you use prun on it, it executes that Python code. And then it gives you this table summary of uh, how long each part of that file took to execute. So what do we see here? Well, we see that. There's something that took 0.68, I assume those would be seconds, but 0.68 to execute, that's the, the longest, and that is some task.py line 3. It's a function called expensive square. <laughs> so let's see what that is. So profile, some task.py. What does expensive square do? Well, it takes an array x, it copies that array, and then it goes th with a for loop through each value, and it squares that value, returns x. So, so this is typically your workflow. You write your code, you run it in the profiler, you see like, whoa, that thing is like 10 times slower than anything else in my program. Like the top one is 0.68, the one below it is only 0 0.021. So that's by far the most expensive call in my program. So let's improve that. And then I replace expensive square with cheap square, which executes really quickly. Um, and then <laughs> when you run it and you look at the summary, you'll see, aha, now the most expensive thing is assert array compare. That's what I used to check that the results were the same at the end. But look, this is only 0 0.023. So, you know, the, the previous one was 0.6 something. And that's now completely out of the equation. So that was a good place to improve performance. So that line over there is now the one that takes most of the time. But that's just a check to make sure that things run fast. So, if I, I mean, I could comment that out. I don't really need that. Um, And now you see like, whoa, everything's only running at 0.00 something. So 
Um, and yeah, I mean, by that stage, you don't really care about performance anymore. It's super fast. Yeah, so that's how you identify code blocks that you want to, want to address, uh, code blocks that are slow that you want to replace with siphon pieces. Um, and we've now seen how we can identify bottlenecks, replace them. Uh, it's always a good idea to write your code in Python, write tests to verify the behavior, and then go back and replace with Cython. If you have the tests in place, it's, it's not a big worry because if you, um, you know, if you break things, you'll know immediately. So, um, yeah, Cython, Cython's a bit of a hack in some sense. It's not perfect. It's, I mean, it's a little bit ugly. We have preferred maybe to have had the speed straight out of the box in Python, but that's not really feasible at the moment. So this is a solution that uh, many projects out there use. We use it in Scikit's image. Uh, Scikit Learn uses it. Lots of other projects use it. Um, you may have recently seen the Julia language. It's, it's been in the news quite a lot. They basically do this right out of the box, which I think is brilliant. Uh, but we have a heavy investment in Python, so um, this, is, this is a good solution for the time being. All right, that's it. <laughs>